Welcome to the Sum of Forces Part 2. I like to call this part critical thinking because we're going to be dealing with the concepts of the Sum of Forces, not necessarily the math behind it, in which we talked about in the last unit, uh, the last lesson about um, F equals MA. So we're going to talk about more of the concepts and how to think about these problems versus um, the actual math involved. There will be an example with some math involved and kind of see how these two relate, but we won't go into too many examples. The one thing I do need to make sure by the end of the lesson that you do understand is this inertial mass all right and it's something different and um, it's a little different than mass uh, as in freestanding gravitational mass and um, we'll talk about that in a little bit um, but it is a little different but it's not really weird it's just another form of terminology that we'll use quick review in case you don't remember from middle school newton's laws of motion we'll talk about the first two today newton's first law uh, and newton's second law and they're pretty close, very similar. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, Newton's first law, in case you don't remember, an object will remain at rest or in motion unless an opposing force acts upon it. All right, uh, we call these unbalanced forces, this opposing force. All right, or uh, a lot of people like to use the word external force added to the problem, you know, that sort of thing. But it's really talking about balanced and unbalanced forces, and really is where the first law and the second law really come into relate. The second law um, is really just the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. So these two uh, laws really work hand in hand. Uh, Newton kind of noticed this, but he kept them separate because one includes math, one includes thinking. And so last lesson we kind of dealt with Newton's second law and how to kind of use that and the differences in that. And really what we're going to talk about today is the balancing of forces and how to use both of these uh, in a normal physics problem. All right, and so if the sum of all the forces, so mass times acceleration equals zero, we're a balanced force. If it doesn't equal zero, we're an unbalanced forces. It's pretty straightforward. Again, the positive and negative is a direction, not a value, all right? Um, you can't have less than um, zero force, all right? But you can have the opposite motion of force that's opposing the initial or the applied force, all right? Um, so you can see there on the screen that we have a variety of definitions and scenarios that kind of help you keep track of these things, but I just kind of want to go through. So if an object feels um, like it's in a balanced force, then this velocity will not change. This is crucial. All right, the velocity will not change, so therefore the object's acceleration is zero. Okay, so therefore we're in balanced situation. All right, can the object be moving? Yes, if it's moving at a constant velocity. So this can be in motion, not necessarily steel, but there is no acceleration, so therefore we're in a balanced situation. If the uh, velocity does change, therefore I am accelerating. Therefore, I'm in an unbalanced state. All right, so my object is accelerating, it's speeding up or slowing down. A couple of things to remember again with all of these problems is that you must draw the free body diagram that we talked about in the last lesson of some forces. Um, it's crucial because it gives you a mental picture where all the forces are. Um, there's a lot of forces acting on this world and so we need to narrow down which ones are we actually working with. All right, so of those forces, if there is a slope to one of the forces, it's not just in the X or just in the Y, well, you may need to break them down into their X and Y components. Um, and then I set up my problem simply as the net, again, the total net um, and X and Y um, is the sum of all the forces or it's maybe just one force with the mass times acceleration, all right? Again, direction is mine, but then the most crucial part about all physics is practice, practice, practice. So. You have a textbook at the end of the chapter, at the end of each section when we start, uh, when you're looking at these problems, get them out, practice them. I won't use all of them in class. You won't use them all in class, but it's gonna be up to you to practice these, these types of questions because this is a big deal when we start talking about just basic level one physics is these force problems and force will come up and um, from here on out so it's very critical that you understand how to solve these problems and what force is and we'll do several labs to keep that straight for you all right so a couple of shortcuts like how to help the thinking again because this is a critical thinking lesson what can we do so if the acceleration uh, in a particular direction is zero then the opposite forces are equal 
Okay, so example, if you are not accelerating up or down, your normal force, so your normal force is equal to the mass times gravity. If you're accelerating, then the difference is in the forces mass times acceleration. Okay, so if you're accelerating, then the difference in the forces is the mass times acceleration. All right, so the subtraction of those two forces is mass times the acceleration, the new acceleration. All right, that's critical there, the new acceleration. Apparent weight. Apparent weight is something um, that is a little different in um, physics teachers and problems and tests really love to work with these apparent weight scenarios because they do happen in nature and so um, and they kind of want to trip people up a little bit you know what if I have an object on the scale and what if I lift it up like an elevator what if I have a person standing in an elevator which is a problem we'll talk to or use in a second if I have a person on an elevator and if I accelerate him up you know what would the scale read and if I uh, lower him down in the elevator what would the scale read and so we'll just kind of go through this each one of these problems but what I really want to get at here is that um, depending on your motion relative to the force of gravity you feel lighter or heavier right and so when you're on a roller coaster when you're going down the big first big hill you suddenly feel weightless right because you're traveling in the same direction of gravity so you're you don't feel the force of gravity as um, as much but as soon as you hit the bottom of that hill and start going back up the second hill you feel very very heavy right and this is the opposite where you're traveling against the force of gravity and so therefore you feel the effects of it much stronger um, some and people in NASA and cars you know little when you take these turns or you uh, fly down this hill you're like oh I'm feeling uh, 10 G's here, 10 times the force of gravity because you're resisting gravity so much. The, the force that you're feeling is 10 times greater than just the normal force of gravity. That's what they mean when they say, I'm hitting 10 G's or, you know, this is 2 G's, whatever that may be. All right. And so down here it says the effective gravity it equals the gravity felt. So push slash minus the vertical acceleration. Sorry, that should say plus slash minus the vertical acceleration of the object this is why you feel heavier and accelerating up and down which is what so what we've really been talking about this is effective of gravity all right so let's look at our problem okay a man who weighs 10 or excuse me 1000 newtons is standing on a scale in an elevator what will the scale read his mass if part a the elevator is traveling at a constant velocity of 10 meters if the elevator is accelerating upwards at 5 meters per second squared or is it accelerating downwards at five meters per second squared? So the opposite there. So again, always draw a free body diagram. Let's get our little person in here. So let's lock down everything so we have a weight. Again, weight is different from mass. Mass is kilograms, weight is newtons, mass times gravity, okay? So if I did the calculation, if I divided 10,000 newtons by 9.81, I would actually get 1.19 kilograms, all right? And so that is just dividing my weight by gravity so I can get my mass, okay? And then in this problem, I have a velocity given of 10 meters per second, okay? If I'm moving at a constant, my acceleration is zero. Okay. So, sum of all my forces, I have force of gravity plus the normal force plus the applied force. Okay, so I'm gonna break those down into their equations. Okay, so that's kind of their initial equations. Um, and so we'll see what we read here. All right, because this, um, because the normal force is what we're, uh, we know it's there, we know it's equal and opposite, we're actually gonna eliminate it because we know it's there and we're not really concerned about it. All right, so really what I'm really looking at here is the mass of the times gravity plus or minus the applied force that's in here. Now, acceleration again is zero, so this goes away, and so my uh, scale is going to read mass times gravity, all right? 
So the sum of all my forces, if I am moving at a constant velocity, is just simply going to be mass times gravity. Okay, the weight of the guy. So his weight is 1,000 newtons. I already know that. Okay, the problem already gave that to me, so there's nothing I need to do. But the problem that it asked me was, is what will the scale read his mass to be? All right, so I need the, ma the mass of the scale, or the read of the scale. So I'm going to use an S for the scale. And so I simply just take the uh, force of gravity, and or the acceleration, and I divide by that, and so that way I can see what that is. All right, and so that's simply going to be what the mass, what I told you earlier, is you go ahead and divide 1,000 by uh, 101.9 kilogram. So, next scenario, shall we? So, we're going to do the same thing. Add up all the forces, come up with our ultimate answer, and see how it goes. All right, so my mass is 153.9 kilograms, so that he gained 50 kilograms just by accelerating upward going up this uh, elevator. And so the same process um, for this one, except for this process, uh, for the third scenario, this is going to be opposite um, because I'm going in the same direction, so I actually would subtract 5 um, from here and multiply. And so my new force here uh, that he will be experiencing is only uh, 490. Therefore, the mass of the scale. All right. So if you look at these three scenarios, the guy's standing static weight is 101.9 kilograms. All right. Um, if he's moving at a constant velocity or standing still, 101.9. But if he moves, accelerates upward, he's going to feel, or the scale's going to read, and he's going to feel the force of gravity increase. And so therefore, his mass is going to, uh, its apparent weight, again, apparent, not actual, apparent weight is 153.9. And his weight, or his mass as he, his apparent weight as he goes down is only 50 kilograms. So if a doctor ever tells you you need to lose weight, just get on the elevator, right, for a few moments. It won't be actual, but at least it'll be apparent, right? All right, so talking about the last few uh, vocabulary words that we need to make sure we have for this uh, idea of Newton's laws is inertia and mass. Inertia is the basically the idea that mass, mass resists motion, change in motion, not really resists motion in general because that's friction, but the changing in the motion. All right, that's what inertia is, and this, so this is why the whole idea of when you take a, a turn in a car really fast, you kind of fly to one side, um, and this is a really the idea that people pay a lot of money to go to an amusement park um, to feel is this idea of inertia. That's really what we're paying for this uh, amusement park to give me is the sensation of inertia and this rejection. But here's basically what it is, is inertia is directly related to mass. So therefore, inertia basically is mass. All right. And so it's a kind of a confusing idea that how can something resist motion but also be mass. And so basically, you have to kind of keep in mind that mass is the resistance of motion. Um, now, it's not true, but that's just kind of an idea of kind of a way of thinking. So I gave you some picture scenarios down there um, that you could do practice at home. Well, maybe not the motorcycle one. Um, but you kind of get the idea. And the last thing we're going to talk about is this idea of inertial mass versus gravitational mass. Gravitational mass is that static steel state that we were talking about. Um, this is where we use a triple beam balance, a, a digital scale. Triple beam balance is nothing more than an older way of uh, measuring things. Some doctor's offices still use this. Um, you step on a scale and they move these weights at the top and to get your idea weight and it kind of balances up and down until it reaches a point and they get your measurement that way. It's more of an older way, but actually sometimes it's even more accurate than the digital because the digital has to be um, calibrated ever so often where this these type of scales typically don't have to be calibrated 
as often. It does have to be calibrated, but not as often. So a lot of people still use these, this old school, actually balancing weights to get that. Inertial mass, all right, is the measurement of the dynamic moving state of mass, okay? And so this is kind of the idea that we talked about with the uh, apparent weight. It's kind of the same thing, um, but not really, okay? Um, in some cases, the inertial mass and the gravitational mass equal the same. That's if it's in a free body, uh, free fall um, object. So we have an object that's falling through uh, through the atmosphere. Nothing's acting upon it but gravity. Um, and so you can see there kind of how the math all works out. That the inertial mass and the gravitational mass can equal the same thing, um, but not always. Is usually slightly different. Good luck.